My kids used to go to a school where all the students got free lunch. Is there really such a thing as free lunch? No. no. We are all paying for those free lunches, right? Because the tax money is what's paying for it. There is no such thing as free lunch. There is no free lunch is, is kind of, um, I don't know, kind of a funny way of saying, uh, expressing the, the first law of thermodynamics. You can't get something for nothing, right? The total amount of energy in the universe is constant. You can't design a system that will produce energy without using energy. So you can't get ahead and you actually can't even break even. So you can't get something for nothing. Conservation of energy requires that the sum of energy changes between the system and the surroundings has to be zero. So if we look at, if we look at the change in energy for the entire universe, that's zero. That will equal the change in energy for whatever system we're studying plus the change in energy for the surroundings, which is everything else. Those have to add up to zero. Um, this triangle is a Greek letter delta, and we use that to represent change. And almost always that means it's the final amount minus the initial amount. So anytime you see a delta, that's the change. So the change in energy of the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings has to add up to zero. It's a little bit like monetary transactions. Um, if, if I, oh, so I bought a car from somebody for $3,000, right? So I expended $3,000. The other party received $3,000. If I take the, the money that I lost, gave away, plus the money that they received, it adds up to zero, right? Because money does not get created or destroyed when you buy and sell things, right? Now, sometimes it may seem to go away because there's taxes or something, but if you account for everywhere that the money goes, it all adds up to zero. Does that make sense? Um, internal energy, the internal energy of a system is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of all the particles that compose the system. This, this is really difficult to measure because how do you measure all of those things? Usually we're going to be looking at change in energy because that's much easier to measure. The change in energy, the change in the internal energy, depends only on the amount of energy in the system at the beginning and at the end. It doesn't depend on how that change occurred. And the money in your bank account is like that. The amount in your bank account um, before and after a transaction doesn't depend on how you purchased it or what you purchased. It's just the difference between before and after. The process doesn't matter. And that's called a state function. A state function is a mathematical function where the result depends only on the final and initial conditions, not on the process. So the change in internal energy for something is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy. We could say the change in energy for a reaction is equal to the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. So let's investigate this state function idea. So here we've got a mountain. Here, here, here we've got a mountain. Um, and trying to get to the top of the mountain. Okay, so the mountain is 10,000 feet. There are two different paths. You can go up path A, which is 12 miles long, uh, snakes around, or you can go up path B, which basically goes straight up. It's only five miles, but it's much harder going, right? So change in elevation is a state function. If you start down here 
and you get to the top of the mountain, your change in elevation is 10,000 feet. Does it matter which path you took? No. Change in elevation only depends on where you are at the end and where you were to start with. That's a state function. Now, how far you traveled, does that depend on what path you took? Yes, it does. This path is much longer, and this path is much shorter. So distance traveled is not a state function, but change in elevation is. There's a lot of stuff in chemistry that's very abstract. We can't make pictures of it. I mean, how do you draw a picture of energy? It, it's pretty tough. Um, so we use a lot of diagrams to try to visualize what's going on with the energy. So an energy diagram is an attempt to visualize the changes in energy. Um, and these diagrams are very simple. Um, so we represent internal energy increasing by an arrow pointing up. And then we'll draw, um, so here's this reaction, carbon dioxide reacting to form carbon and oxygen. And so the carbon and the oxygen products have higher internal energy than the reactant carbon dioxide. Um, you know that because I just told you that. That's the only reason you know that. So the reactant is lower in, in energy. The products are higher in energy. So we can look at the energy change. The energy change is the final energy minus the initial energy. So here the change in energy is positive. Where did that energy come from? So the, our system that we're looking at are the, the reactants and products. And if that system gained energy, where did it come from? Outside of the system. It came from the surroundings. So in all of these discussions, there's two parts. There's the system and there, there's the surroundings. And those can be defined differently. It's in, like in a financial transaction. You have the buyer and you have the seller, right? So here, the system received energy from the surroundings. So the change in energy for the system is positive. Like in your bank account, when the balance goes up, right? That's a positive experience. It's a positive change because money came into your account. Money is a lot like energy, or energy is like money. The surroundings lost energy. So the surroundings paid the system a certain amount of energy. And the change for the surroundings in the system must equal each other. One's negative, one's positive. That makes sense? If we um, turn this equation around and look at the reverse reaction of carbon and oxygen reacting to form carbon dioxide, well, these are the same chemicals that we looked at before. Here's carbon and oxygen. They have higher internal energy than carbon dioxide. But now we're going from this one, the C and the O2, to the CO2, and so the change in energy is negative. The system has lost energy. Where does the energy go? It goes back to the surroundings. So the change in energy for the surroundings here is positive. Now the change in the energy for the system is negative. It's like buying and selling cars. When the energy flows out of a system, it all has to flow into the surroundings. That would be a negative change in energy. Energy flowing into the surroundings, then, for the surroundings is positive. So just like in a financial transaction, whether it's positive or negative to your bank account depends on whether you're buying or selling, right? Whether this energy is positive or negative depends on which side you're looking at. So if it's positive for the surroundings, then it's negative for the system, and vice versa. You could also think of it as, uh, there's a typo, like transferring money between your checking and savings account. Yeah? So when it transfers money between your check checking and savings account, we see more like a closed system because it's all over account? 
Well, if you think of your accounts as the universe, and you're transferring money between accounts, overall, the amount of money that you own is the same. But you're shifting it back and forth between accounts. So if you take money out of your checking account and put it into your savings account, it's negative for the checking account, it's positive for the savings account. The amount of money is the same. That make sense? That's the way it is with the energy transfer. One thing loses the energy, something else gains the energy. How is the energy exchanged? Through heat and through work. Remember, heat is the transfer of energy based on difference in temperature, and work is um, a force exerted through a distance. So, um, stupid pointer. We use um, Q to represent heat. Um, I don't know why, it just is. Um, we use W for work, so that makes sense, right? W is the first letter of work. Q is heat, W is work. Heat and work are not state functions. So they are like the distance traveled up the mountain. They do depend on the process. The overall change in energy doesn't. <coughs> Bless you. So the change in energy is equal to heat plus work. Um, so it's important to get our sign conventions straight here. So for heat, if a system gains thermal energy, energy coming in, Q is positive. If it loses thermal energy, if it transfers energy to something else, it's negative. So the same as thinking about money coming in, money going out. Um, work, work done on the system or work done by the system. So think about maybe getting a nice shoulder massage, right? So someone doing that to you, doing work on you, that's a pleasant, positive experience, right? I guess if you're really ticklish, that's not going to be a good analogy for you. But um, work done by the system, that would be you giving someone else a massage. You are putting out, you are doing something for them. So that's going to be draining to you. You're going to get tired. That's negative. Someone doing it to you is positive. So heat, heat gained is positive. Work done on the system is positive. Work done by the system is negative. And then the change in internal energy, energy flowing into the system is positive, energy flowing out is negative. Okay, so here we have a, a good pool table, a nice smooth table. And we're going to look at the cue ball hitting um, this purple ball again. So this cue ball has an initial kinetic energy of 5 joules. As it rolls across the table, this is a real situation. That ball will slow down, right? It won't keep bouncing back and forth on the table forever. It slows down because of friction. So there's some friction. And so as the ball rolls across the table, it's going to slow down a little bit. And it's losing some kinetic energy, and that energy is lost as heat. It doesn't, it is still in the universe, but it's, it's gone from the ball into the table. So at, at collision, the cue ball has kinetic energy of 4.5 joules. So it lost 0.5 joules. So we can look at the change in energy for that cue ball as being the sum of the work and the energy, I'm sorry, the work and the heat. Because when it hits this ball, it does work on the purple ball. And so the work done was minus 4.5. It did work on the other ball. And the heat lost through friction was minus 0.5. The overall change in energy for that ball is negative 5 joules. It's the sum of the heat and the work. Here we've got a rough table. Now when that ball is rolled on the table, it loses more heat. It slows down a lot more because the surface of the table is very rough. So still with an initial kinetic energy of 5 joules, 
as it rolls across the table, it slows down a lot. It's going to lose three joules of energy to heat caused by friction. So at collision, it's only got two joules that it can do work on the purple ball. The change in energy for this ball is the same, negative five joules, because it's a state function. It started out five joules of kinetic energy, it ends up with zero. But the process was different. Um, Q and W are different, but their sum is the same. Any questions? Change in energy is a state function, depends only on the velocity of the white ball before and after collision. The sum of Q plus W being equal to delta, a, uh, delta E is the same for both tables, but the values of Q and W are different because heat and work depend on the process. The process was different. So in terms of the change in energy uh, the change in energy for the first ball, the energy lost by that white ball, is equal to, but opposite in sign to the energy gained by the surroundings. The surroundings here would include the pool table and the purple ball. Right? Some of the energy went into the table and some of it went into the ball. <coughs> 